whole life, <laughs> decades, dedicated to promoting native plants. Um, I know she has a huge fan club. There are several people who said, oh, Judith is going to be there. I'm, I'm signing up. So please help me welcome Judith Larner Laurie. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. And before you go get me water, I wanted to say how incredible Sherry and Carrie and all the volunteers have been. I would still be sitting in my car in the parking lot if not for them. <laughs> and this is, I just want to plug um, Foothills Horticulture Program, too. I was here in the 70s, and it was a great, uh, $3 a quarter. I lived up the road on Moody Road, and um, it was a great way to get some basic biological knowledge. And I could, they were just great people, and I could argue all the time, which I did. And one of the things that um, is interesting to me is that we were told not to use native plants. I mean, this is a long time ago, because having evolved with the local insect world, they would be very likely to be eaten up. <laughs> and now, here we are celebrating those very pest uh, pests. <laughs> and that is amazing. Well, I just wanted to start with um, our quail. Now, I didn't, where I live was a quail refuge, which was a state-operated program. Um, long since discontinued, but we still have a fairly decent, but fluctuating, as they do, population of quail. And this is an example of something that I can't really take credit for. Um, you know, I've studied quail ecology and tried to give them what I think they'll like, but they are very adaptable. Um, probably the best thing I could do for them at this point would be to kill my neighbor's cat. <laughs> And that is problematic. I think there ought to be a session on neighbors. <laughs> but so just thinking of the wide range of opportunities to create or recreate or restore habitat, I wanted to start with this example, which is new to me because um, my daughter did this rebellious thing of moving to LA from the town of Bolinas. A lot of the kids moved to LA for some reason. Um, and the street that they were living on, Pershing Boulevard, was like a six lane highway, which twice we nearly got killed crossing the street to our car. But anyway, so I was just kind of horrified. But at the end of the, at the top of the hill was a trail that will take you to the beach. Um, and there was a sign that said the, that it was a restoration project. It was very faded, and I couldn't, it didn't really make a lot of sense, but I started, suddenly it hit me that this was the El Segundo Dunes. And, um, well, so I tried to do some research on this, and I couldn't get too far. And then in one of those strange um, serendipitous events, I got a, manuscript from a stranger, um, and it was all about the 20 years of being a volunteer with Professor Rudy Matoni from the Natural History Museum of LA. Um, and it was a great story. I, it should really definitely be available, because he had a great knack for explaining the ecology and making the human interaction seem hysterically funny. So um, this is the, the project that is intended to save the federally listed El Segundo butterfly. So here it is, nectaring on its beloved Eriogonum parvifolium, sea cliff buckwheat. Um, so this is everything to this butterfly, and without it, it can't exist. So, Restoration for this butterfly included, here, here's one of the dunes, and here's the Eriogonum parvifolium, the sea cliff butterf butterfly. Um, 
So when they first tore up this area, it was 3,200 acres of dunes and considered one of the most beautiful flowering spots in LA and it would have been a great entrance to LA from the LAX airport. Um, here's another photo of that iriogonum. Well, what happened was that when they tore up the soil, then they did one of those, I know, let's get a mix of seed and, and just sow it everywhere. Now, I have a seed company, and this is a tendency that kind of baffles me, but I do understand it, which is the idea that mix a bunch of seeds together and then nature will kind of take care of the rest. But one of the things they did was they included this species, which is another iriogonum, iriogonum um, California buckwheat. And um, the thing is that this had a very negative impact because it fostered and supplied nectar to a lot of other butterflies and two moths. So what happened was that they had to remove all this iriogonum. That's one of, been one of their main um, activities. So, and even there, I was collecting it before I decided it was bad. <laughs> but the, the reason this happens this way is because the iriogonum, the, the non-locally native buckwheat, blooms earlier and longer than the parvifolium. So um, the parvifolium, when it starts to bloom, the El Segundo butterfly senses it and emerges from the chrysalis at just that moment. And then um, the, they fly around and lay 15 to 20 eggs a day. And then when this stops blooming in August, they're uh, on to the next phase, which Liam will surely describe to you. And so the, uh, the, the non-native um, iriogonum with its very long bloom period encourages competitive species. So that's a very nuanced um, situation, which not many of you are going to experience. But I would have this fantasy of walking up and down the street Nobody seemed to know they were living on the El Segundo dunes and handing out uh, sea cliff buckwheat plants. And it started to remind me of my own home situation. Um, this was a project that my t-shirt organization, Friends of the Coyote Bush, um, presented something to the real estate agents so that they could hand out to the new people and give them an idea of what the ecological situation in my town was. Um, and it really was quite helpful. We started out with, when I moved there, there was no, not a single native plant garden. There was a lot of hostility to the idea. <laughs> and now there's about 75 native plant gardens. So. And it's not just me doing it anymore by any means. So um, we have some common land, which has the ugly name of the sewer pond lands, but um, we'll just call it the commons. And people argue about it as they do about land issues. But anyway, it had this plant, um, Hosakia gracilis which is thought to be the uh, obligate host plant for the lotus blue butterfly, which hasn't been seen in maybe something like 30 years. But nonetheless, they're still hoping it will turn up. And they have a recovery plan in, uh, already written. And I, think, I find that rather delightful from the federal agencies. <laughs> But anyway, it likes uh, coastal bogs and was seen up and down the coast uh, into Mendocino. So when uh, we took over the common lands and turned them into the sewer pond lands, they also said, hey, let's get a, a bunch of seeds and throw them out. So they got a mix um, with a lot of things in it, most of which are not there anymore, but a few 
have survived. This is a, a photo of what they think the lotus blue butterfly would look like. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, well, I just did have to say that with this plant that has disappeared, they think that's why it has gone extinct, because this plant isn't around anymore. Um, but it's, it's so beautiful that we use it for my daughter's wedding. And then all of these lotus blue butterflies appear. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Would have been nice, but no one would have gotten it. Um, and the, this, they have pictures of them uh, somehow. <laughs> so, but this is another uh, bad guy, and, and what was in the mix was this tall fescue, Festuca arundinacea. And it's impossible to get rid of. For a while, they grazed the land, and that kept it down somewhat. But then some people decided, um, a good friend of mine, that grazing wasn't good for that land. So they took it off, and now it's an unbelievable weed. And one of them was a friend of mine. And he said, if there's one thing I'm proud that I've done, it's get the cattle off of the sewer pond lands. And I said, yeah. <laughs> No, I wish I just said that. <laughs> um, another example of the importance of being local in terms of a gardener is um, this is the coastal form of the California poppy, which used to have its own place. Um, but now I think it's been lumped. So it does cross with the regular Eschultzia californica. Um, but it acts very differently in the landscape, so it's a perennial and it blooms for about six months. So for six months it's providing um, nectar and it really um, is just completely easy and gorgeous. And I used to worry that it was taking over my garden, but in a wet year it's knocked back because it has a deep tap root and our water table's too high. And then in the dry years, it springs forward. But it can be used as a ground cover. This is our leach field, and this is the bathtub view, which I really think is important. And when it stops blooming, it looks good enough to be a ground cover in the winter. So that's an example of using something locally specific, and then it turns out to have these characteristics that serve you in a way that you hadn't known about or thought of. So here's the orange uh, central California poppy. Let's see. You can see it in this gorgeous, this is our backyard. <laughs> Not really. So when I moved to this area, I fell in love with this kind of landscape, this coastal scrub and the way it tightly knit and, hold, and coats the bluffs and hillsides. And I thought it would be fun to use some of those plants in my garden. And at the time, I had to learn a few lessons. So. Um, this is a wren tit, which is very much part of that kind of, a, of habitat. It's called California's native sun, and it stays within the boundaries of California. And they don't move much, so the ones you have in your garden are your friends for years. They used, it used to be thought that they were monogamous, but now other people think that was a fantasy. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have a flat garden, it's a marine terrace, and this is, uh, so I started using coyote bush, of course the mainstay of coastal scrub, and it gave me almost instant uh, structure to my garden, you know, within about two years, and also incredible habitat. About 200 different insects uh, frequent it when it blooms, late in the fall, in a time when not much else is blooming. And, you know, people would say, what is that handsome shrub? And I'd say, that's coyote bush. And they go, oh, wow. 
and it started, it taught me about the value of sticking to the uh, sort of a keynote shape, the mounding, rounded shape of the shrub, of coastal shrubs. And this handsome bird is the white crowned sparrow, which uh, also loves that kind of habitat and coastal scrub, and coastal chaparral, it's a brush lover. And what's one of the interesting things that our local Point Reyes Bird Observatory has told us is that it has a song that varies. So that the song that's about, of those that live three miles away is very distinctively different. Um, this is a garden shot. And you can't quite see it, but we've made a trellis out of a coast live oak. <laughs> when my employees want to do something playful, I let them. <laughs> and one more uh, bird of coastal scrub is the bush tit. Um, little flocks of it go chittering around, and what I've noticed is that the way they, they like to zoom through shrubs, like hazel, that give them room that are not so tightly packed together. And at the end of the day, they're all zooming through our hazel. Um, so I learned that the, the coyote bush, um, which a lot of people made fun of me for, for even mentioning, because it's considered such an interesting plant and all too ubiquitous, um, can behave very differently in different situations. And on our marine terrace, it looks really great for about 10 years, and then we would cut it down as though we were a fire. And we could do that about three times, and then we had to send it on to its reward. <laughs> but to get a garden going, a larger garden, is incredibly useful. And here's one of the many flies that frequent it. This is a taquina fly that is important in controlling agricultural pests. And the rounded shape of the ceanothus. So, you know, this our half, half joking, half serious um, application form to friends of the coyote bush. Really, I started because I got this great set of animal stamps. <laughs> <laughs> so another way to um, give your garden a locally specific flavor is to look at the genus Clarkia and pick the ones that grow around you and some of them may not be in the trade. Uh, this one definitely is the mountain garland, Clarkia unguiculata. And it's extremely easy, and it's like a garden workhouse horse. And um, it's a host plant for this, the Clark Sphinx hawk moth. And here's a Clark Amawena, the farewell to spring that we call um, the wild form because there's a horticultural form that is usually what's used, and it's so gaudy, I've taken it out of the slideshow. <laughs> Too many people like it. <laughs> um, here's the Clark Amwena growing right out of the rocks. It's tough. So where we live is supposed to be the southern limit of uh, this species. So I see it all the way up Mendocino and Humboldt. And this species, the uh, Ruby Chalice Clarkia, Clarkia, Rubicunda grows around here, and it reaches its northern limit in our county, so I grow both of these. And um, one more Clarkia that um, is rarely, at least where I used to see it, I'm not seeing it anymore. Uh, many species that are not listed are still fading. This is Red Ribbons Clarkia, Clarkia concinna. And it actually turned up in our garden somehow, which maybe the seed was already in the soil. It's, we can't know, but since we're surrounded by a sea of weeds, I don't, I, it must have been there, I think. <coughs> and this is from up north, the Santa Rosa area, Clarkia imbricata. 
Does it have a common name, Phil? Vine Hill Clark, yeah. Oh, Vine Hill Clark, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Of course, you always want the Clark, yeah, that your neighbors up just slightly up north have. This is a, the incredible variety of this, these species, and they're so beautiful and they're so easy. Um, this is Clarkia purpurea, subspecies purpurea. And this was kind of an experiment. This is Clarkia batai from uh, the Monterey area, the Punchbowl Godisha. And we were just playing around, you know, because some species respond to day length and some don't. So we wanted to see if we could grow these two together because the Clarkia blooms in early summer and the baby blue eyes in early spring. Um, and it looks quite pretty. So uh, creating habitat doesn't mean that you can't play around. And another genus that I think lends itself to identifying your location are the Phacelias. And if you live in the desert, this is gorgeous. And here it is. Um, seeking the shade of some yucca plants in Joshua Tree. And in the Central Valley, the Great Valley Phacelia, Phacelia ciliata. There were some, when I took this picture, there were some pronghorn antelopes in the background. And this is from up north, Phacelia volanderi, which has interestingly become weedy. <laughs> um, and Lumnanthes is another uh, species that can, if in certain areas, at least around where I live, identifies where you live. And here's one, uh, the Douglas Meadow foam, which is very common around us. And we, I got one handful of seeds from uh, near where it was growing, and then the guy came out and yelled at me. So. Um, I apologize, but I kept the seeds, <laughs> and that was, it grew about you know four feet, four square feet, and then it just spread like this on its own. And from a, a vernal pool is this meadow foam with uh, Panergynus occidentalis, a uh, native bee. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. um, I think they're the easiest of the annuals, they recede incredibly. Um, here is the host plant for the uh, Great Valley Longhorn Beetle. Great Valley Longhorn Elderberry Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an extremely wonderful plant in its own right as well. And here's the beetle. So the baby blue eyes never did well for us, um, even though here it is in Japan doing great. Isn't that amazing? It's acres and acres of blue, blue, blue. There are a lot of photos of this around. So we tried growing the, uh, a, sub, a variety of the um, baby blue eyes. This. Uh, Mophila and ZCI variety Atomaria, which, you know, the common name is like baby white eyes. I don't know, but it's, um, it, and it's done really well. It spreads and it recedes. Here's one of my favorite tarweed gatherers. And I just realized this is on the cover of Kat Anderson's book. <laughs> um, but which tarweed was she gathering? So Madia elegans is very widespread. And this one grows around us, the uh, hayfield tarweed. Did you all get slides, lists? No. Oh. I can do that. I can do that. OK. Yeah. Um, so one interesting thing about this in our area is that there is a spring blooming version and a fall blooming version. And here are the seeds, which are edible, and um, there's a lot of them. And this is another uh, tarweed seed gatherer. 
I learned a lot from this because this way of gathering seeds, they call it seed beating, but with this species, it's um, more like seed tapping. And as far as leaving the habitat in place, this is amazing because what ha since this, like so many wild species, bloom sequentially, um, you get the ones coming into your gathering bowl or basket that are really ready to fall and the other ones stay on the plant <coughs> and so do the insects because these are very buggy so in a good way I mean um, <laughs> so you know I've seen people vacuuming seeds <laughs> off plants and and usually cutting them and then there's nothing left so although this is something only a romantic would do. Um, it's really fun and interestingly beneficial. So um, one aspect of, I used to hypothesize that the, one of the reasons the wildflowers were not doing so well was because they had lost the ants that moved their seeds around. Um, and here are some of those ants moving grass seed, which apparently they prefer. So I don't know if that's true. Most of the studies have been done in um, the Finbos in Africa. But this is an important uh, element of the ecology that it's hard to think what we could do anything about. But one thing you can do is make sure that you're not fostering the Argentinian sugar ant. And it, I, we don't have a bad problem with it, but um, just, you know, even things like not having an open co compost help. Um, this is Bromus carinatus at the Marine Carbon Ranch. And the seed we were all eating, um, this is the first stage of making canole where you toast it in a pan and then make mush. And so if you're tired of oatmeal, <laughs> all the native bunch grasses were food, including the red maids, Calendrinia ciliata. This is one of the few that moved into our garden or was already there because we found it growing in subsoil which it likes because it's a colonizer plant. It likes to go where no one has been for a while. And there's the seed, which um, I'll talk about, yeah. So um, I'd like to thank Phil Van Solen of Calflora Nursery for getting me some of this plant. This is uh, Kellogg's Yampa. And to me, it's a great example of what can happen when you uh, expand what you want your garden to do. Because I started becoming interesting, interested in having a wild food garden. I had one plant of this and an ethnobotanist came by and had us eat the roots, which were really sweet. So I started growing it, the flowers. Um, it was the host plant for the um, anis swallowtail but it's been largely replaced by the delightful fennel. It's really fun to divide it. Um, you have to do it just the right time if you want to get the roots. So you can't see this, and it probably doesn't mean anything, but I had to show this because, so I got really interested in all the periteridia, and I got this book about them, and it's from the 60s, so they used to list every place where one had been collected and put in an herbarium, the location. So when I looked at Periteridia kellogii, the one we were growing, <coughs> it uh, had, it mentioned the Bellinus Mesa, where I live, which has never happened to me before. <laughs> but I knew I was doing the right thing. Um, that was from 1866, I think. And, um, you know, because I was like, where <laughs> was it growing? So um, in these different strands of uh, native plant gardening from when I started 
In the 70s, a lot of it was stimulated by droughts, and that still is happening. And probably the next major strand was uh, a sense of place. This and this created a whole genre of books, writers, Gary Snyder. Um, what was his famous short? Don't move, right? That was his uh, bioregional gatherings. And um, after that was habitat gardening. And now there is the wild food garden. So trying these plants out for our own food as well is really interesting. So this, is, um, this represents a phenomenon called myrmecockery, which comes from the Greek word meaning circular dance. Um, these are uh, seed dispersal ants, and this does require this structure. On the ant is a, a liasome. That's what the ant people call it. Uh, the, the plant people call it an appendage or an aril or a caruncle. But what it is, it's a structure that is full of lipids. And the ants take it to their nest and feed it to their larvae, which love it and thrive on it. So it has a very special chemical composition that makes the ant want to pick it up and move it. Well, the eliosomes are wildly variable kinds of structures. Um, and I really could sit here all day and show you they're so weird. Um, here's another one. But I was thinking, this is the new superfood, right? It's full of, you know, all those good things that we want, whose names I forget at the moment. But um, so this is a phenomenon that about 5% of the plants have. And I think that this very common species is it does have an appendage, and it turns up in places I can't imagine how it got there. So maybe there's a myrmecocorus ant in my garden that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. And maybe they haven't all been killed by the Argentinian ants, you know, who have this huge super colony. So I still live within the super colony of Argentinian <laughs> ants. If I moved north, I might escape it for a while. One of the reasons they're so strong is that since they are one colony, they don't fight each other. Um, uh, the other ants know when other ants from other colonies are trying to take over their territory and they spend a lot of time fighting. But these ants don't expend that energy. So um, they can just eat all of the native ants they want. And there are some of the native ants. And of course, um, this creature needs them. And they're going, they're going extinct, or their um, lessening population is said to be related to the um, disappearance of their ant diet because of the Argentinian ant. So, in our garden, we wouldn't try to, our coastal garden, we wouldn't try to have this guy, but we do have this guy, the alligator lizard. Um, yeah. <laughs> He's in the laundry room. <laughs> so I was sitting in our backyard one day. <laughs> And I was thinking about certain things, like our political process and stuff. <laughs> and it was starting to make me mad, because although one of the conventions I really liked, because it was so inclusive, but yet I didn't feel included. Because where were the people like us, the people who really, whose primary focus is about the health of the land? The only time the land was mentioned was in terms of the White House lawn. <laughs> So I got curious about the White House lawn, so I tried to find out some more about it. And first of all, it was a swamp along the Potomac. 
which we now call a, fr a freshwater wetland. So they got rid of that swamp, which set a precedent. And then uh, the main grass that they grow in that lawn is my old enemy, the tall fescue, Festuca rundinacea. So um, I just think that a campaign to restore the White House lawn would be so unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> So I started getting ready because you have to start early. This is my um, committee. <laughs> and this guy, the um, long-tailed California weasel, who has shown us the true heartbreak of chickens um, from 15 to 2, pretty fast. He's so cute. <laughs> And also this guy, the gray fox, which it's so hard to tell him apart from the not really native red fox, but the gray fox climbs trees. And this one lives in our apple tree. So he's on the committee. And so are these tree lovers who um, have hung from every tr tree in my garden. That is their claim. And this is where we'll work on it. <laughs> and this is me getting started already. <laughs> so, um, you know, every situation is going to have its different set of possibilities, limitations, challenges, hard questions, insoluble dilemmas, and unexpected joy. Um, so just because you can't bring back the grizzly in your yard, it's better to light a single LED bulb <laughs> than curse the darkness. <laughs> Thank you. Stay up here. <laughs>